Another very prominent innovation of the digital paradigm is the concentration of ownership. And that has made it to do with these two characteristics here, the economies of scale and network externalities. So if you don't know what they refer to, feel free to go back to, to the previous lecture, but we can also see the effects of what they're having. Uh, the idea of media concentration is not new. Uh, every time you have an information product again, and that can be a digital product, it can be a video game that costs a billion dollars, or can be something else, some kind of certificate or a flight ticket or a book or good old movies and songs. And we already saw this concentration back in the broadcasting paradigm. Uh, so we have two kinds of uh, media concentration. One is when the same kind of digital product connects to the same kind of digital product. You basically buy a competitor, then you concentrate. This is called horizontal ownership concentration. Or if you take somebody before or after in the supply chain. So if you buy somebody who traditionally sold to you, or if you integrate somebody who um, you were selling to in the supply chain. So this is called vertical ownership in concentration. And there's also a cross, a circular ownership when both combine. So let's see some of the effects. Well, positive network externalities, remember what that was? That means that the value of the network exponentially increases with every additional node that joins the network. But the effect of that is that I now have a very big network. So I'm an online retailer, Amazon, and I have a very big network of people who buy and sell things on my platform, other people. I don't even own that. But now suddenly it turns out that I have so many customers and I know so much about them that I might as well purchase one of my suppliers. So instead of buying batteries from somebody else, I just create my own batteries. And many companies do that, also in the traditional world. I mean, so there's the Costco has a brand and the Target has a brand, and all of them have also their own brand. So what they do there is vertical ownership integration. They basically you know, purchase or compete with one of their suppliers, and now they're selling their own product on their platforms. Because of the network po net positive network externalities, they already have all the consumers on their platform. They know what they want and they have access to them. Now, there's also horizontal ownership, and that has to do with digital economies of scale. Digital economies of scale, remember, that means that a digital product is 100% fixed cost, almost 100% fixed cost, because the variable cost, creating a copy of it is just right mouse, right mouse button, copy, paste. So there's no variable or marginal cost really involved in it. Now, once I have a product, I can then go on and basically compete with my competitors. I can take their market share. That's why eventually there's one dominating social network or there's one movie provider because they have these large economies of scale that they push the competitors out of the market. And both of them also combine to cross and circular ownership. And you can think more about that. And maybe in the tasks that we're doing together, you can explore that a little bit. But the effects of that, you see all around. So if you see the big digital players, Google, for example, you can go here to this Wikipedia page and just look at the list of mergers and acquisitions that Alphabet, the Google parent company, has been doing, starting with YouTube, which it purchased, or some traditional companies like Motorola, which was in the mobile phone space traditionally, and the same for Facebook, which nowadays is called Meta when they purchased Instagram or WhatsApp or Oculus. Now they're called Meta with Oculus, they go to the VR world. And these are just integrations that they did also based on these kind of facts, the positive network studies, the networks that they already had. Facebook was not in the hardware business, got into the hardware business with Oculus Rift. Google as well with, with Motorola. Now Google uh, traditionally was not in the business of providing content. It was a search engine with YouTube and others. It went more into this business. So then they're expanding and this is facilitated by these kind of characteristics. Now we combine that with an additional digital trade, interoperability, we get to something that is also very characteristic of the digital age, not necessarily only based on these digital characteristics, but it's uh, particularly difficult to break because of this interoperability. Remember interoperability, it means that different networks have to talk with each other. 
And often they talk, especially when if they want to connect to a central system in a hub and spoke network, you now they need to speak the same language. So they need to be interoperable. One of these networks is not as payment rates, it's not only payment, but is that you have to pay somebody to access the interoperable with your kind of network, especially if you have a dominant, dominant role in the marketplace, which is cemented by some positive network externalities, which makes it very difficult to kick the one in the center of the throne because they have exponentially more value than the smaller networks. So payment rails, that is the historical stories like this. In the 1930s, Namco, that was a producer of arcade games, Pac-Man, you might, you might have heard of Pac-Man, I don't know if you played it. Uh, that was a very popular game back in the 80s in the arcade games. Well, it was stuck with these games on the hardware, and that's what people would do. Nintendo would, companies would do the same thing. Nintendo was not an open platform. Nintendo was also just a hardware that produced games. But Nintendo was in the houses, and then this arcade game provider approached Nintendo and said, hey, can you publish our Pac-Man game on, on your platform? And Nintendo was first like, no, that's not actually what we do. But, you know, they played a little bit difficult, and they said, okay, if you really want to do that, well... I charge you 10% licensing fee and you have to pay me 20% because I have to produce these cartridges. I mean, this, with your game on these plastic cartridges, that's actually what they look like, these cartridges. And we have to produce them. So, you know, if you sell your game for that price, I take 10% and 20%, I take a 30% cut. And that was actually fair game. The math worked out, worked out there. 40 years, more than 40 years later, we still do the same thing. We still have the 30% of payment rails, and that just got historically adopted. There's not more, and, and, and additionally, nowadays, you also, when you go to different platform, be it Microsoft Xbox or Nintendo or, or Sony PlayStation, you have to adapt to the proprietary hardware of this platform. So Microsoft Xbox uses a different GPU. So if you program a game, you have to adapt to that. Um, or if you play Nintendo with NVIDIA or PlayStation with their different hardware, you have to adapt your software game to their hardware and additionally, you get penalized by having to pay 30% as the game maker to the distributor. And that's just because historically, that's how it's been. Uh, but if you want to be interoperable with these platforms, then that's what you have to do. So for example, if you are an independent game provider, let's say you are FIFA, you don't have anything with hardware, you actually know more about soccer, but you have this game and you, you create this game about a FIFA, a soccer game. Now you want to run it on Xbox, you want to run it on Nintendo, you want to run it on, on Sony PlayStation, and let's say the game costs $60, that's how you want to sell it, $18. Go to these centralized platforms with which you want to become interoperable. And even if you, well, traditionally, and there's always... Things are changing, but I'm just saying traditionally, I can think about it. Once you have one game and you bought it for $60, if you want to play it on a different platform, you would have to spend the $60 again because the new platform wants their $18. So if you then buy three times the game for the three different platforms, you again almost back at the $60. So that's actually what's happening. Now, once this then migrated to some bigger platforms, when Steve Jobs introduced the world to, to digital distribution, basically with iTunes. And that was back in the year 2001. That was very innovative. These The app stores didn't exist yet. iTunes was, was the first one and Apple innovated in that space. Steve Jobs basically emulated the 30% commission rule. Not for any real economic calculation. It was just, that's what it was. So you said, you know, you want to distribute something on my platform. We just do the same thing they did back in the days with, with the arcade games and, and, and Nintendo. That's, that's what we also do. So they started to charge 30%. Google was a little bit um, more flexible with that. So they said, well, you could theoretically on your Android device, download the app directly. You don't have to go to the Google Play Store. But if you want to download Microsoft Word or, I don't know, Spotify directly from the provider to your Android, we're going to give you a warning. And what they say then, your phone or personal data are more vulnerable to attack by unknown apps, like you know, Microsoft, Microsoft Office would be an unknown apps. By installing apps from this source, you agree that you are responsible for any damage of your phone and for loss of data that may result from their use. So basically, they're intimidating you. And I'm telling you, like I'm, I supposedly, supposedly, I study this digital, digital things, and I should know about that. I mean, I have two PhDs, but like if I read that, I would think like, whoa, should I really download that from there? That's pretty intimidating, right? So this is like, I, 
I probably would go back to, to why should I not download it from the Google App Stores? But in the Google App Stores, cha-ching, 30% get charged. So that is, you know, they don't prohibit you to do that, but at the end, they channel you through that. So why would they do that? Well, because of cha-ching, right? <laughs> so if you look at who are the two most valuable brands of the history of humankind and have been for basically for the last decades, you can see how valuable it is. Sure, Apple produces a hardware phone and Google produces, has a search engine that it maintains. But this trick alone, taking 30%, I mean, that's what governments do, right? That's a tax, basically. 30% of everything that goes through the centralized exchange that they cemented with network externalities, uh, that has been the subject of a lot of a lot of discussions. And it's been extremely profitable for these two companies. So, okay, so these kind of digital trades have led to a clear concentration of ownership, but there's often a counter argument to be made is like, okay, so maybe um, the ones who own it are bigger, but maybe the content is actually more diverse. And that's a long discussion that has been ongoing, media concentration, media ownership and content diversity. Even back in the broadcast paradigm, when we still were on TVs, and on radios, the idea was actually, okay, so we have a lot of different TV stations, but aren't they all showing the same thing? And even if we go further back to the beginning of my discipline of communication, communication science was born by studying Nazi propaganda. And what Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister of the Nazis said, well, what you need to control a media system is ostensible diversity that conceals an actual uniformity. So it means, yeah, we look like the other way around. We look like we're diverse, but actually there's a uniformity behind it. So how you can think schematically about that is, okay, usually we think, okay, we have one big conglomerate. And if that would all be the same content, yes, that would be a concentration of ownership and uniformity of, of, of the content as contrasting that with many different providers who have all different content. There's the political left and the political right and the political whatever and the progressive and, and so forth. So there are many different opinions out there. Now, the counter argument is you can just also do it like that. Why not? Right. So it's not necessary that the big concentrated owner on the app store, for example, or on the big network has all the same content. There can be very diverse content. And there have been studies that shown that even in very concentrated social media, people get exposed to more diverse news as they've been ever before. Because traditionally, I mean, what, what did we do before the digital age? We were already reading one paper newspaper maybe every Sunday. And not that that wasn't biased either. So that was a concentration of content as well. That wasn't a very diverse content. And now it turns out that even if you're on the same social media network, that might be a concentration of platform and of ownership, there's a lot of diverse content going on. And this is ongoing. So there's a lot of very active research with the biggest players in the industry, the biggest social media provider, the biggest content provider, also talking, arguing and measuring together also with governments and saying, is there media diversity? Because there's a lot of pressure of maybe breaking up. Are these companies too big? Is Google, is Facebook, are they too big? Is Amazon too big? And they say, well, actually, what do you mean we are too big? We have a lot of diversity in us. We just take advantage of economies of scale, of network externalities. The interoperability make it necessary that we all speak the same language. And so this is a very hotly debated ongoing debate with a lot of need for future research. Now, some other digital trades add an additional layer of complexity to it. So because we might have this diverse content by different providers, you might have a diversity, but the computational paradigm actually led to some particularities that some of the content, while it might be diverse, might be kind of like blended out to a degree that we actually don't see it anymore. And then we only see this one homogeneous content that is provided to us on the platform, even so the platform might be many, uh, very diverse. And uh, this is often a discussion that is led under some modern catchphrases as filter bubbles or echo chambers. And they're actually different. 
And uh, they're also academically not very clearly defined. I have not yet met a really clear cut definition that convinces me. But the filter bubble argument is the following. You can think about that's uh, a state of intellectual isolation that can result from algorithmic recommendations. So you use the digital footprint, as we talked about in the lecture about social media. You learn about the person, use the n equal one digital trade, and you do that with machine learning. And then based on the digital footprint, you use customized content that you give to somebody and you just filter it to them. Now you show them what they've been interested in in the past. Uh, and that leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy somehow. So the guys who are interested in racing fast cars, you show them what they're interested in. And the parents who lost a child in car accident, you show them what they have been interested in and now guess five years down the road where they will end up. Well, they probably become more extreme in their convictions. And if the filter bubble is really insulated, then you know polarization starts to happen. And that is facilitated by computation, by storage, we know about you, and by computation, by machine learning, and the N equal one uh, digital trade, the personalization. Now, we add something on top. We add the network structure, the polydictionality, and the exposure election, selection on top, and we get what is known as echo chamber. So you can already see here from the digital traits, they're quite different, but they often uh, complement each other. So echo chamber is in a quite hermetic, once you are in the filter bubble and you're hermetically locked away, then it can happen that Together with others, you create an echo chamber, a place that confirms and amplifies pre-existing beliefs insulated from rebuttal. Because usually you don't, you know, it's not so comfortable to argue with somebody. You want the confirmation bias. And we talked about that in a previous lecture. The confirmation bias makes you feel comfortable. So you are there in your own echo chamber, which adds to that process and leads, could lead to even more polarization. And that is an open question. Does it, does it not? As I said, I have not seen very convincing study that actually define all these phenomena, but you open the newspapers, you read about that all the time, especially when it comes to if the media is too big to fail, if these platforms are too big to fail, and so forth. Now, while this is hotly debated, and, and when you open the newspapers, you will read about it, I mean, listen to policymakers in the congressional hearings, you, you hear all about what's going on there as we socially construct uh, the, the future digital media environment. I got a lot of respect for this question when we did a little study that was back in the, in the election of Donald Trump in 2016. We looked at actually polarization and what polarizes people. Now, when we say content diversity, uh, the first question you have to ask yourself is diversity of what? Do we only talk about left wing and right wing diversity? Is that all that matters? And is that even so clearly defined? Is it really a, a one-dimensional left and right wing of political opinion or what, what is there? One thing that we found, you can, you can measure many hundred different variables. We just looked at YouTube content and we looked at the emotions expressed by the YouTube content that people watched before, that people, the interest they expressed before and that they watched after the elections. And what we found is this polarization actually when we showed people sad content, sad and some little angry content, people came together. When we showed them joyful content, then actually polarization happened. Now I understand I don't make myself very popular if I go to you know Silicon Valley or, or to Washington to the policy makers. I have the solution against polarization. We have to show people all day long sad content that makes them, no. <laughs> I mean, they do come together. So it's a difficult, problem. First of all, the question of ownership and the question of content. We have to understand more about that and what's good for society and for what kind it is good. And second of all, the kind of content, diversity of what and what kind of diversity do we want to keep? And we need a certain kind of diversity in order not to get stuck because we want to innovate. And for that, we need to make new combinations of the world. And now, now we're getting all around, but basically, so that's another uh, digital innovation phenomena that you can think about. Filter bubbles and echo chambers that come from the combination of different digital traits.